the screen had three columns. On the left was my life as I had planned it just before I was born. The middle column were all the conditions that came to me during my 26 years of life in order to help me accomplish what I had planned. Third column looked as though someone had created a stamp and the stamp said, objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished. I've created a four month course for my pay what you can roots to Samadhi community that I'll be running from August through November. We're going to be deep diving into the practical aspects of how to develop a deep, tangible spiritual connection. Check the description box to learn more. So would you like to start by sharing your near death experience? Well, yes. First of all, I have to say that I was 26 years of age when this happened in 1969. And it was a regular Monday morning, uh, getting the, I had one child getting the baby ready for the babysitter and getting to work. But throughout the day, it was my first day back at work after a period of being away on sick leave. And doctors really could not tell what was wrong with me. And um, I returned to work that Monday, but throughout the day, I noticed that I was first uncomfortable and then I was in a lot of pain. And somewhere around four o'clock, I looked at the, the clock and it dawned on me that the pain I was experiencing felt like labor pains. And it was kind of in and out every 15 minutes. So I asked if I could leave early. And um, this was in London, England. That's where we lived at the time. Got into the elevator. And as you can imagine, in the 60s, elevators were kind of like very, very kind of old fashioned. And when the elevator stopped, usually they stopped with a jerk. And when I experienced jerk, oh my God, I really went into a tremendous amount of pain. Now, the only other person in the elevator with me was a Hindu woman. And I knew she was Hindu because she was wearing her traditional outfit and the dot on the forehead. And as the, 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 as the elevator jerked, she looked at me, she says, are you all right? And I said, no. And I collapsed. When I collapsed, um, she, the, 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 the door opened and she got help from other people who were in the lobby. And because the hospital was in close distance to the building where I worked, um, they hailed a cab. And they put me into this cab and she got into the cab with me and got me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I think I was kind of like semi-conscious and I insisted that I didn't want a stretcher. I wanted to walk in and they, between the cab driver and, and um, my new friend, they kind of held me up and then we got into the emergency room and I collapsed. Now the, the taxi driver, drove away with my handbag because my handbag was in the cab. You see. He brought it back the next day, but he drove away with my handbag with all my identification in it. So now here I am, I'm collapsed. I can't speak for myself. And they're asking her, what is her name? I don't know. Is she married? Is she single? Blah, blah. She knew nothing about me except that I collapsed in this elevator with her, you see. And she stayed. She stayed the entire night. Wow. But I'm... Um, they rushed me into emergency room because now they have discovered that I have had a baby that has been dead inside of me for three months. Nobody oh. knew that I was pregnant because when I had my first child, uh, it was a very traumatic delivery and they told me I would never have children again. So nobody, including my doctor, thought of running a, a pregnancy test. So we, they wheeled me into this operating uh, room. And I guess the last thing I had in my consciousness was this extreme pain, you know, extreme pain in my body. And um, all of a sudden, I find myself in a very calm, very calm and peaceful. The pain is gone. And I'm in this very peaceful state. But I'm up on the ceiling. And I'm looking down at my body 
on an operating table. And the first thought that enters my head is, how could I be in two places at the same time? Mm -hmm. Because it seemed to me that the, the consciousness level I was in, I was a lot more acutely conscious than I ever would have been when I was kind of alive, you could say. <laughs> and so I'm looking down at these doctors and nurses, you know, and the nurses are kind of scurrying over with the equipment and so on and so forth. And I'm baffled because, first of all, I want to let them know that I'm no longer in pain. And there's no need for them to continue with this, this operation. See? But then I realized that they could not hear me. So the next thought in my head was, how do I get off of this ceiling? <laughs> and get down to floor level. My conscious processing was very, very, very more alert and acute than it would have been when I was in my body. <clears throat> and as soon as I thought about it, I found myself on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now I'm running from one doctor to the other, trying to say, hello, this is me. You don't need to perform this operation. I don't understand why, but I feel fine. And then it dawned on me that they could not see me, nor could they hear me. And then the thought in my head was, well, women are a lot more sensitive. Let's try the nurses. <laughs> so I'm running from nurse to nurse going, hello, this is me. I'm here. You need to listen to what I have to say. And then it dawned on me, they can't hear me either. And then I look at the equipment, you know, the equipment that is kind of tracking your, your heartbeat. And I watched the moment when it's flatlined. And I thought, there's something wrong in this room. First, the people cannot see me. Now the equipment has malfunctioned because you see, you could not explain to me in the consciousness level I was in that I had just died. That just didn't cross my mind. So when the doctor turned and picked up the paddles, you know, the paddles are gonna shock your heart. For some reason I could see the corona of electricity around the paddles. And the thought in my head is, I'm not dead. If they apply that amount of electricity to my heart, they may accidentally kill me. So I have to get out of here. And with that thought, I found myself through the ceiling and into an extremely dark tunnel. And when I say a dark tunnel, the, the darkness was so deep that it's kind of hard to find words to explain it. And I'm moving very, very swiftly through this very, very dark tunnel. And then I come around a corner. And as I come around a corner, I could see the end of the tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, there was this amazing velocity of white light. And again, the thought in my head, because I'm processing, the thought in my head was, if I survive this, I'll probably lose my sight. Because you know how we say you should not look up at the sun? Well, the the Light before me was infinitely more intensive than the sun. And then I merged. I exited a turn and I merged with the light. And I know this sounds kind of lame, but there are really, really no words in any language to, ex to explain what it feels like when we merge with light. It was this most exhilarating feeling, this most peaceful feeling. Um, and I was very aware that I had become love. I was very aware, instantly aware that light and love is the same particle. And I was acutely aware that I had become, I had merged with this light and I had become love. And then the next thought in my head, well, how does one get around in this environment? And no sooner than I asked the question in my mind, I began to move. And I moved and I traveled in this intensity of, of light and feeling this intense feeling of love. And I stopped at, a, at a, what would have been a vast um, TV screen. I mean, today we have large TV screens. In the 60s, we didn't. It was the largest TV screen I'd ever seen in my life. I still haven't seen one as big. We stopped at the screen and the screen lit up. And when the screen lit up, I began to process the 26 years that I had just lived before I entered this state. And the screen had three columns. On the left was my life as 
I had planned it just before I was born. And what it is that I was intending to, to accomplish when I got to earth. The middle column were all the conditions that came to me during my 26 years of life in order to help me accomplish what I had planned. And then there was this third column, which just I just burst out in laughter because the third column looked as though someone had created a stamp. And the stamp said, objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished. Objective not accomplished. So I'm moving my head from the right, the left hand column of what was planned to the circumstances that came into my life that should have helped me to accomplish what I came to accomplish. But instead, I had other ideas in my head about what it is I wanted to accomplish in this earthly life, you see. And so therefore, these laudable um, ideals were not being met. And therefore, this stamp, you know, as, as I looked at objective number one, number two, number three, it was this stamp on the right hand said, objective not accomplished. And then I think um, the screen moved. And when it moved now, I, I'm like watching a screen of my life, how I had lived it. And, you know, I had gotten married at 19 and went to England. We left, I was born in Guyana, South America. We left South America and traveled to England with the intention of getting a better life and getting an education. And it seems as though we were in the middle of accomplishing that, but I had adopted all of the first world objectives. You got to have money, you got to be rich, you got to, you know, you have to accumulate stuff that will speak to what you think is your identity. And I'm watching this as this screen is, is scrolling very slowly. And I'm looking at the objectives that were set and I'm like, how could I have been so stupid? I, I spent my energy and my time accumulating stuff that had nothing to do with the plan that I came with. And as I'm looking at that, I could see why I attracted the people I attracted into my life some of whom were very positive and very loving and very caring. Others were there as challenges. And, and one of the most amazing thing about that is particular one person in my life who I considered very negative at the time and very challenging was really someone who really lived with me in another lifetime, loved me dearly and figured out that love was never going to allow me to get it. So in this lifetime, that person um, made a determination that they would devote their life to irritating me, to finally get me to where I needed to be. So it was very interesting. And I, I, I observed the 26 years. One of the things that stood out for me was prayer because I was raised in a very Christian, deeply Christian environment and I was taught how to pray. But now I'm looking at this review and I'm thinking, they only taught me how to tell God what I want. Nobody really emphasized that I needed to be asking God to fulfill my destiny. You see what I mean? So then I'm asking the question, but, but prayer has two sides to it. There is the asking and there is the silence. So we could listen. But then it occurred to me that my religious upbringing did not teach me about meditation and contemplation and being silent before God. So now I'm asking the question, who in the world taught me how to pray? Because what they taught me was only one side of the image. And then, of course, what sprang up were the different uh, institutions and, and, and people in those institutions who were kind of responsible from Bible study to whatever. To, and I'm thinking, but they did not teach the entire concept. So the screen comes to an end. But while I was on that screen, I discovered that you can't get paid twice for anything in this world. That we ask, we pray, and we ask for what it is that we need. And if when we get it, we use it so that we can make money or the world's compensation, then we've got what we asked for. We can't expect to get a blessing for something that you're doing for which you're being paid. 
And that it's the things that we do, that smile that we flash that is full of light. It's the things that we do voluntarily and without compensation that really brings the blessings into our lives. And the screen came to a, a, a stop. And I was one of those young people um, living this Christian life with a lot of questions from the Bible. At age 9, 10, 12, I had these phenomenal questions. And so the one question that popped into my mind, now I'm standing there and the screen is completely blank. And the question that popped into my mind was, he, meaning Christ, said, I came so you can have life and have it more fully. What did he mean by that? And no sooner I asked that question, the screen began to re-scroll. And now I am at the Akashic record. At that time, I did not know what it was, which is the record of everything that has happened, everything that has a potential to manifest itself into the world. And I'm now looking at the Akashic record, and now they have taken six past lives and dumped it into the one that I just reviewed. And the screen starts to re-scroll. And now it's a whole different review. I am looking at myself living in times when there was darkness on the earth and people walked around with torches. I watched myself as a woman and what it meant to be a woman in those days. And, and there was war between the tribes and um, they decided that they will take the women and put them in small boats and put them out to sea because they were losing the war and they were afraid that if the women got killed, there would be no way of um, generating new life. And they put us on small boats and put us out to sea. And most of us, including myself, drowned. And in this lifetime, I've really, really had some love, the, love to be in the ocean, etc. but fear. And I'm now working through that fear. Um, I saw myself at um, when they pulled Moses out of the bulrushes, I was one of the women who was present at that time. I saw myself living dire, dire, dire poverty. I mean, hunger. And you see, when you're reviewing this thing, you're experiencing it. You're experiencing the hunger. You're experiencing the fear, you know. And then I saw myself as a... Of course, I had the experience of being very poor. I also had the experience of being wealthy. It's, it's all balanced. But I think the one that really, when I left, uh, it took a while for me to be able to process, was I saw myself as a, as a child, a Black child in the cotton fields, picking cotton besides my mother. And I could feel... The, the pounding of the hoof of the master man on the horse. I can hear every time that whip goes out because if, if you can't keep up your quota, you're whipped, you see. And I know that I'm a child and the fear that I feel that when the master man gets to me, I'll be whipped because I'm a child. I can't keep up with the quota. And then the screen, the screen um, moves to another lifetime. And guess what, Melissa? I am the white man on the horse flipping the whip in the cotton fields. We live it all. We live it all. There's no need to point fingers. Um, and I review the seven, seven lifetimes and how they have affected the choices that I have I made in coming to earth this, this time around. And um, the screen came to an end. And when the screen came to an end, again, my thinking, and I teach this a lot these days, what you think is what you become. The energy that you're following in the world is the energy that you will attract onto you. So I began to ask the question, well, how does one move around in this environment and what more is there to see? And I started moving and I came to a river. When I was a child in Sunday school, we sang the little hymn, Yes, we will gather by the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river, it flows from the throne of God. And there I was at the river. On the other side of the river were 
hundreds of souls. And I knew that during many lifetimes, I had lived and interacted with them, that we had something in common. And the something that we had in common was this thing called love. And they're on the other side of this river, and they're beaming this phenomenal amount of love. And as they beam the love to me, I can see that love turns into light. And so they're beaming all this amazing amount of light to me. And then my aunt who was the most recent person who had died in my family, she stepped into the water and indicated to me to come. So I stepped into the water and I'm moving towards her and she's moving towards me. And then just as we're getting ready to that spot where we can hug each other, she stopped and she looked at me and she says, I'm so sorry, but they're sending you back. And I said, why? I don't want to go back. And she says, no, they're sending you back. And I said, why? And she says, well, they want to send you back with a message. And I said, the millions of people back there, they can find someone there and give that person the message. You see what I mean? And they said, no, it's a message we'd like for you to take back with you. But there is more to life than meets the eye. And life is eternal. Now, with that piece of instruction, I suddenly found myself falling, falling, falling. I mean, I can experience the falling. And the moment when I crashed into my body, even though I was on the heavy anesthesia, I felt the incredible pain. And it was like moving from this place of extreme love and joy and happiness and peace, and then to instantly hit the body, excruciating. And that led to three years of serious depression because I did not want to be here. I wanted to be able to return to that place where I had experienced such amazing love and purity and joy and where you asked the question and you got the answer in a knowingness, not necessarily with words, but in a knowingness. Now, when I crashed back into my body, um, they had me in a, in a small room in the hospital, and they had two nurses sitting at a table who were supposed to be observing me, an observation. And I opened my eyes and discovered that all of my senses had become enhanced. And these two young nurses were sitting at a table and they were working with bandages or something, their hands were moving. But they had a radio between them and the radio was playing classical music very, very softly. And I could hear the music and I opened my eyes and now I can see the notes. Every note is tied to a color. Every color is tied to a mathematical symbol. And I'm watching the light, the amazing light of the different notes and the different frequencies and how it's interacting one with the other. And these two young women sitting at the table are being totally unconscious of the fact that they're absorbing all this beautiful energy. And then I think two male medical people came along and they're interacting with these two females. And again, I can see this amazing light that they're consuming, you know, the body's consuming it, but they're totally unaware. And I want to say something, but I can't because I've got this, this thing in my throat, you see, I can't speak. And then the two, the two medical guys left and the two young ladies began to discuss because apparently they both attended the same church. And on Sunday, one worked and could not go to church and the other one went to church. So now the one who went to church is describing the sermon that was preached. And the sermon had to do with hell. And I want to scream at this woman, that that's not true. There's no such thing as hell. Let me tell you about what it's like on the other side. But of course, I can't speak because I've got this track here in my throat, you see. And so I'm listening to this and then it suddenly dawned on me, but normal, because there was a clock, you see, but normal. Less than 24 hours ago, that's what you believe. What could have happened to you that your belief system has just completely changed? And the journey began. My Hindu rescuer, I was in hospitalized for nine days. And she came every single lunchtime and she sat with me. And out of that 
became a beautiful friendship. But we, we both agree that since she was very, very much Hindu and I was very, very much Christian, we agreed that we would never talk about uh, religion so that this friendship could develop. And, and that allowed me to walk beside a, a deeply religious Hindu woman and observe their practices. And she got to observe mine. The journey home from the hospital was very interesting because once I got out into the open, I realized I could see the leaves and the trees and the energy and the light that they generated. I could see, I could look at the, the tree and see all the way down into the roots and how it pulled the energy from the earth all the way up to the top, the top of the tree to give to us oxygen. So my sight had been enhanced. The other thing that was enhanced was <laughs> light bulbs just went out all around me. Um, if I was walking on the street lights, the, the, the bulbs would blow. Electronic equipment would malfunction around me. It took quite a while to be able to adjust to that and to, to manage that. But it started a whole new way of experiencing life. Experienced three years of serious depression because I did not want to return. And I had no way of knowing how I could re-enter this beautiful, beautiful space that I had experienced. And that's what drew the eight teachers into my life. So that eventually I was able to get out of my body and travel dimensionally. Now, I did not speak about my experience for 15 years because mm. in the sixes, you didn't go around. There was no name for it. And I was very acutely aware that if I talked about it, they probably put me in a mental institution. So I did not speak about it for 15 years until my mother was dying. When my mother was dying, I wanted her to know that she was going to a beautiful place and that there was no need for fear. And for the very first time, I shared it with my mother. Mm -hmm. And then soon after both my mother and father passed, we came to the United States of America and I began the journey of ordination. And I um, was doing internship at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. And a senior pastor came in one day with this book, and he was very angry. And he, he opened the trash, he put the book in the trash. And I said, well, why would you do that? And he said, well, that some fool wrote this book about having a near-death experience and living. And my eyes lit up. He went upstairs, and I dived into the <laughs> And I pulled the book out, you see, and I started reading it. And I went to him and I said, he's not lying. I had the same experience. And then it was the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church that encouraged me to speak about my near-death experience. This is a question that a lot of people have. Maybe you have a, a perspective on this. Why is it that we can't remember what we planned for our lives when we get here? And it seems to be so easy for us to get off track. Earth is a very low vibration. Mm -hmm. And we have descended into a low vibration. To help you to understand that, think about having an old-fashioned radio. You know, those little old-fashioned mm -hmm. radios. And it was very, very limited in, in, in bandwidth, if you know what I mean. Yes. And so if you wanted, like, for example, I was born and raised in Guyana, South America, a third world country at the time. If you wanted to catch a station in, in, in England or America, it was almost impossible. There wasn't enough bandwidth and the frequency was too low to be able to connect to that level. Got that? Now, when we are born, because since then I, I have had the opportunity to actually watch my last child design his lifetime while he was in spirit put the plan in place, then get born. And my youngest child is now 35 years of age and I have watched him live exactly what he planned. Right out to him getting married last year. We drink the cup of forgetfulness when we are about to be born because if we don't, all that information will be in the way. You see, and we take it for granted that we can use our hands, we can use our minds, we can walk, we can talk. But that's phenomenal stuff that we have to relearn 
once we enter the earth. So we drink the cup of forgetfulness so we can master the things that we have to master. For example, while we are still babies in the womb, we have to master the art of building bones. If I'm walking with all that memory, I mean, I only saw seven lifetimes. If I'm walking with all that memory in my head, it would distract me from the basic things that have to be accomplished in order to live on, on Mother Earth. And so we file it away at different levels. Some of it has been filed in the super consciousness level, where if we build our vibration, follow me, and we build a vibration higher, then we can access that information. If we do nothing about lifting the vibration, then access of that information becomes difficult. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you for explaining that. You mentioned that we have some relationships in our life that are very loving and comforting and then other relationships that can be more of a challenge. And perhaps there's a reason for that based on past lives. So if there is a relationship in our life that is challenging, what's the best way for us to handle that so that we can accomplish whatever we're trying to accomplish with that relationship? There's a line in the Lord's Prayer that is very much aligned to a line that you found on the doorways of ancient temples. The doorways of ancient temples you'll find as above, so below. In the Lord's Prayer, you will find a line, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, you see, Somebody taught us to pray, but they, they taught us to pray. Well, whatever you want, you ask for it and you will get it. But then we need direction. You see, I needed, I needed a spiritual teacher to teach me what to pray for. He said, don't pray for things that you can actually accomplish here with your two hands, your two feet and your brain. Pray for things that is really difficult for you to accomplish, like manifesting your purpose. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Thy will be done. As above, if you're not a Christian person, as above, so below. Because before you came here, you came with a plan. And the goal was that you will accomplish that plan. And you placed into that plan, this is very interesting, you placed into that plan people who are going to lavish you with love. And people who will love you so much that you will drive you out of your mind and into your spirit. <laughs> I love that way of looking at it. Definitely had some of those in my life. Oh, yes. And they do a good job. <laughs> so I remember you talking in a previous interview about how you tried to return a couple times. And I don't remember the details of that, except that they kept sending you back. Is that something that you'd like to share about? I'm so glad you asked that question. When I first returned, the first three years, I was seriously depressed. I attempted suicide three times. And then I got depressed because I couldn't kill myself. <laughs> so at that point, I'm like, well, if you, oh, and then they, they hauled me back upstairs, as I call it, in the dream state. And I met with, there were nine beings and they told me they were the council of nine. And they told me quite categorically that if I continued to this effort of trying to take my life, uh, what I thought was a very difficult way to live with this knowledge that I had, they would just, when I get to the other side, slam me back into a baby's body with the consciousness that I had. And if I thought I had problems, <laughs> I would really experience some serious problems because they'd slam me back into a baby's body with full memory. And, and that would be a, an almost impossible situation to live by. And, um, and then they sent me back. And soon after that experience is when I met this elderly couple in my book, Awakening. I, I do talk a lot about the elderly. He was 97 and uh, she was she was um, she was three years younger than him. 
phenomenal wisdom keepers on the planet. Phenomenal wisdom keepers. And he, between them, they held my hand and they took me through self-discovery. And they took me to this place that made me understand, Norma, you're not a Guyanese. You're not an American. You're not British. All of whom, you know, you belong to the kingdom of God. You belong to the kingdom of oneness. If you, if you have a problem with the word God, you belong to the kingdom of oneness. This is who you are. And your birthright is love. And when you can embrace that, then and only then can we allow you the freedom to travel. But for as long as you kind of link to this low vibrational human thinking that human nature is it and all there is to it, you can't be allowed to travel. So then um, I was made to, I had to, I was made, I had to be in bed at eight o'clock every night for three years, eight to 11, and they would download information. And then I'll wake up at 11 o'clock with all this energy, do my housework, what have you, because I'm raising children, see? do my housework, whatever. But it took me having to make that commitment that I was going to step out, do whatever it takes to step out of that human nature vibration, which was low. And then they taught me the reason why they showed me the energy in music. So music for me is my world. Music is what I took into prisons. My, 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 um, my purpose turned out to be transforming lives in prisons. And I ended up there 27 years as a, as a chaplain, but also taking spiritual principles and putting it right alongside clinical practices to help people transform. But in order to do all that, I had to go through this understanding that you have got to let go of the human nature part of you because that's tied to a low vibration. And you've got to begin to, begin to do this work. I call it work. And that will allow the vibrations to rise higher and higher. And then when it rises past the seventh dimension, then and only then you can begin this work of travel. And yes, I've returned four times. Wow. Amazing. So I have to ask you now, how do we let go of that human nature part? Because I think so many people know they need to do that and want to, but struggle to actually do it. Discipline. You know, I, I have I have five children, all of whom have been athletes. And one of the things that I've learned from them is practice makes permanent. If you're practicing the wrong thing, <laughs> it will establish itself as permanent. If you're practicing the right thing, it will establish itself as permanent. You see what I'm saying? So I've got some kind of seven little rules. First, I go get the body fit, the mind will follow. Because you see, you've got to get out of your mind and into your spirit. And rhythm is the key, you see? So when I start working with people, the first thing we got to do is let's get into exercise. You know, you, you got to get into rhythm. You have to get into the rhythm of music. One of the very first things I try to establish for people who are working with me is what is the rhythm that you came here, we came here with a rhythm that, and we have to develop it, follow the patterns until we develop it to its, its fullest, its fullest um, potential. And one of the things that guides have said to me over and over again, there is music for every human being that walks this earth. There is music out there that has been put out into the eaters that will help them to follow their vibration. So the first thing I do is try to find what is your rhythm. See what I'm saying? Get the body fit, the mind will follow. Begin to become mindful. Because we, we take our attention and our awareness. Begin to see your attention and your awareness as money. If I gave you a million dollars, you'd be very careful how you spend it. Your attention is worth more than a million dollars. Where are you spending it? So there's, thing, there's this thing called mindfulness and spiritual study so that you are being aware where you are placing your focus, how you are spending your energy. You see what I'm saying? And then the discipline of routine. 
got to get your life down discipline to, 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 to a routine. To this day, I started off with a routine of being awake at 4 30 in the morning. I've retired now, I still come awake at 4 30 in the morning. It's a habit. If I'm in Japan, if I'm in Korea, if I'm in London, I can tell you when it's 4 30 in the morning in America. So you get your life into rhythm and you get your life into routine, you see. And you begin to pay attention what is your intention for your life. Because in the human nature stage, we are taught that it's got to build up wealth and it's got to build up character and it's got to build the earthly things. You've got to move now to a place where you begin to ask yourself, what is the intention that I have for my life? And you're asking the universe, you're asking the oneness to help you to manifest. Does this make sense? Yes, thank you for explaining that. Water is to human, water is to the spirit. Hmm. What oxygen is to humans. Hmm. So you, you know, there's a reason for keeping beautiful flowers in a vase in your house, you know. You're keeping a vase full of water where spirit can come and manifest. So that you begin to become more aware, mindfulness, more conscious of the real things that matter if you are going to ex ex enlarge your vibration. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get to the place where I've gone as far as the 16th dimension, some people will tell you there is no such thing, but there is. Once we get past the seventh, the seventh is that darkness. Wow. It is near that experience as we talk about. You got to go through the darkness, get beyond the darkness to the light. Wow. Am I making sense? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the dimensions? Is that something you're comfortable talking about? Well, it took years for me to be able to travel. Mm. <laughs> the interesting thing is I'm, I'm working on this, you know, working on my life. And, 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 and I'm, I, I would like to say here that my journey brought me through something I call practical spirituality. Because here I was, I was married, I was having babies, I was raising children, and I was expanding my spirituality. I did not have an hour to sit down and meditate. My meditation time was 10 to 15 minutes. But what it, did, what it developed for me was a practical way. You see, walking became a part of that rhythm. And I would park the car three or four blocks away so that I can walk. See what I'm saying back and forth. Um, so eventually I was so obsessed with this wanting to travel and, and I, could, I could get out of my body, but I couldn't get out of the room I was in. <laughs> and that was very frustrating. And I have this friend, we have been friends, girlfriends for 48 years. And um, I taught her how to get out of her body. And she could get out of her body and travel, but I couldn't. So it was very, very frustrating. And then believe it or not, I had this gentleman who did my taxes. <laughs> That's who he was. Once a year, I would go, he would do my taxes. I started a small business, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm so frustrated that I can't do this travel. And this, uh, one night I'm talking to my guides and my guide says, you know, you're, you're not acknowledging the obvious. The obvious is right under your nose. And I'm like, what is that? And he said, this gentleman that does your taxes has the potential to do that. But in my head, I only knew him as a tax preparer. <laughs> I had no idea whether he had any spiritual ideas, ideals, or anything like that. And so uh, my guide said, well, why didn't you ask him? Well, I didn't have the courage to ask. So I read, sat down and I wrote a letter. And I said, there's an experiment I'd like to try. And I wondered whether you would, would help me with this experiment. And so he gets the letter and he calls me. He says, what's the experiment? And I said, you know, you don't have to come to my home because I really don't know where to begin with this. Well, it turned out that he was the ideal candidate. And he said, um, let's play with some music. The piece of music that emerged was the Canon in D. And um, he said, well, let's tape it with three minutes silence between the two tapings. And then we just sat around one day, my son, my girlfriend, myself and him. And um, 
playing this beautiful music in the background. I find myself relaxing, relaxing. And he just simply said to me, he said, I'm going to conk. I'm going to conk backwards from five. Let's see what happens. And he went five, four, three. By the time he had three, I was traveling. And that began the journey. You travel to seven, and when you get to seven, it's total darkness, and you have to pause there. But for me, you know, other people may travel differently. I paused there, and it's total, total darkness. And then there was like a rainbow of light that came up. I call it the kaleidoscope of light. It's beautiful rainbow, brilliant, brilliant light. And then I found myself as though someone had put a vacuum cleaner on me and dissolved me right down to just an itty bitty speck. And the speck began to peruse the rainbow of light in front of me. And when I found the place in the rainbow of light that represented my own vibration, I was allowed to enter. And then from there now, from seven now, you begin. Nine is music. Oh, my God. And I remember thinking, if I had listened to my mother and learned how to play the piano, I could possibly write all this music down. You know, you travel through. You travel through eighth and ninth and tenth. Uh, when you get to, to the twelfth, there's another breakdown. And I've been able to go as far as 16. But whenever I get out of body, the thing about me, I want to go right back to the Akashic record because I always have questions. I had three notebooks full of questions that I started asking from age 12 until my maturity. So when I get out of body, I generally go to the Akashic record. Unlike what there may be people, other people who can do this, but when I go to the Akashic record, I can't read other people's records. I go to read my own and to see what development. I may be working with someone and, and there's something that I need to be reminded of. But I'm, I'm, I don't have that ability to go to the record and read other people's records. Well, Norma, thank you so much for everything you've shared with us. I'd like to give you a minute to talk about your book and your website and anything else you have going on. Well, my book took all of these years, you know, I'm 79 now. It took all these years for me to write this book. And um, it's called Awakening. And it starts from the, my birth, because I think my awakening got started at birth. Uh, all the way to my near-death experience, it talks about the near-death experience in depth. And then it follows my life towards um, accomplishing the purpose I came here. Because when I came back from the near that experience, I could, could remember everything except the fact that I knew they told me what my purpose was. But when I came back, I forgot what it was. And I could see why, because there was so much training that was necessary for me to accomplish it. And eventually I got to this place and I'm asking, I'm asking of my guide. I said, what, what is my purpose? I need to know, you know, I'm getting older. I need to know. And I was driving in a car one day and the voice said, pull over. And I did, I pulled over and I pulled over, I turned off the engine and one word dropped into my mind, prisons. And prisons? Am I going to get, do something wrong and get incarcerated? I mean, I got very concerned at this one word. So I got in the car now and I'm screaming at God, I, I, I know nothing about prisons. I, 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 I have nothing to say. Well, that, 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 I ran out of gas. <laughs> I drove all the gas out of the car and eventually I went to my pastor and I said well you know I'm hearing here prisons and I blah 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 and she listened to me and she says um you finished she says it seems to me um nobody's asking you to do anything except go put your feet in pair of feet into a prison and then you might discover what it is they're asking you to do <laughs> show up if you show up, then the spirit of God might show you what to do. And that's exactly how it worked. Huh. Exactly how it worked. 27 years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives. Um, but, but when we can get to that place of living, living out our purpose, it's the most joyous, peaceful. I got up for 27 years and went to work, but I never thought of it as work. Never felt like work retired three years ago. So the book outlines the life before 
kind of the influences in my life as a younger child, et cetera, et cetera. And then it talks about the near-death experience. And then it moves to the training that took place after the near-death experience and the fulfillment of that purpose. And, I, and the way it ends, I, I won't give it away, but you got to read the book to see where it ends because I ended up in death row, working with people on death row. Mm. And the goal was to help them to understand there's more to life than meets the light. Life is eternal. They can't take your life away from you. They'll take your body away, but they can't take your life. They can't take your spirit and your soul. And I think that was the most um, rewarding place to teach that lesson to people who knew that they were going to be, they were going to be, um, their life would be taken. And my website, I have two websites. Uh, one is Reprogram Your Life. That is mm-hmm. the life coaching part of my life. Uh, reprogramyourlife.org and then my website for my book is awakening-series.com and there you will find the information on the book selling very well Um, you'll find information on the book and from that website you can reach me if you get to Awakening Series website, you can. There's a button there you can press, and you can send me a message. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions, and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my Pay What You Can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my Clips channel, and LoveCoveredLife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.